Welcome, fellow travelers. Welcome to all who have journeyed this path for a while. Welcome to those who are new to the path. Welcome to those who aren't sure where the path lies. Welcome to new visitors and to old friends. Welcome to the young at heart, to those of all ages and colors, all orientations and gender expressions, all abilities and cultures and opinions. Know that you are welcome here, no matter what. For this is God's house, and all may enter here. Welcome to everyone. We hope that you find peace and uplift in our worship this morning. May God's love lead us to ministries of compassion and justice in this world. The Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus at his baptism. This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. After that, Jesus went into the wilderness, where he was tempted by power, by earthly pleasures, and by the devil. Returning home, Jesus proclaimed the nature of his ministry to the folks at home, and then went outward to do that ministry in the world. As followers, we too are called to carry good news to the poor, liberation to the oppressed, and release to the prisoners. Let us pray. O Holy One, give us inspiration, hope, clarity, and the tools we need to continue the mission of Jesus. Amen. I'm reading from the Common English Bible, Luke 4, 14 through 30. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been raised. On the Sabbath, he went to the synagogue, as he normally did, and stood up to read. The synagogue assistant gave him the scroll from the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor and proclaim release to the prisoners, to proclaim the re and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the synagogue assistant, and sat down. Every eye in the synagogue was fixed on him. He began to explain to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled just as you heard it. Everyone was raving about Jesus, so impressed they were, they were by the gracious words flowing from his lips. They said, this is Joseph's son, isn't it? Then Jesus said to them, Undoubtedly, you will quote this saying to me, Doctor, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we've heard you did in Capernaum. He said, I assure you that no prophet is welcome in that prophet's hometown. And I can assure you that there were many widows in Israel during Elijah's time when it didn't rain for three and a half years and there was a great food shortage in the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to a widow in the city of Zarephath in the region of Sidon. There were also many persons with skin diseases in Israel during the time of the prophet Elisha, but none of them were cleansed. Instead, Naaman the Syrian was cleansed. When they heard this, everyone in the synagogue was filled with rage. They rose up and ran him out of town. They led him to the crest of the hill in which their town had been built so they could throw him off the cliff. 
but he passed through the crowd and went on his way. After Jesus was baptized, he went into the wilderness and was tempted by Satan. Short story, he passed the tests and he begins teaching in local synagogues. Soon enough, Jesus makes his way home to Nazareth. Now in Nazareth, the home tone sound folks had heard about Jesus, about his teaching in other places. And when Jesus read to them and taught in that hometown synagogue, in the place where he grew up, they were impressed with him. Here was Joseph, Joseph the carpenter's son, one of their own, displaying such skill, such knowledge, and so much wisdom. Now, the next thing to happen was supposed to be a party. The hometowners were ready for a celebration. Jesus was home, and he would apply his talents and his gifts to local issues. But it didn't go that way. Jesus abruptly tells them that he will be applying his gifts elsewhere. His calling, he tells the hometown folks, is not for them, but it's for the wider world. Just as the prophet Elijah helped a foreign woman, Jesus would be healing and teaching beyond his hometown. Well, the mood of the crowd shifted quickly, and Jesus pointed out that no prophet is welcome in the prophet's hometown. And the people, the crowd, they grew angry. They chased him to the crest of a hill where they intended to throw him off. But Jesus, being Jesus, escaped, never to return home again. This section of Luke that we've heard today is sometimes called Jesus' first sermon. Now, that makes no sense to me at all, because the text clearly tells us that he'd been teaching elsewhere before he gets home. And and that sermon that he preaches when he's at home, it's really just one sentence. It's also referred to as Jesus' mission. I think that's more accurate. Jesus reveals his calling to the hometown folks. He reads Isaiah 61, and he claims it as his purpose, too. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. God has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus reveals his expansive mission, his expansive purpose to take the good news out into the world. And the hometown folks asks, what about us? Now, we sometimes pretend otherwise. But I think it's human nature to be self-focused. Maslow identified this in his hierarchy of needs. As a former early childhood educator for 30 years, I observed this in infants and young children every day. Those children who have their needs met can begin to reach outward with empathy and concern. Those who are struggling for unconditional love or other basic needs were unable to move forward or outward. By six months, I, could, I watched empathy or fear already deeply manifest in children. You see, until we feel some sense of security and well-being, it is very hard to look outward. Now, this is not bad. It is not a sin. It is biological to focus first upon survival. Unfortunately, socialization too often teaches us to become greedy and selfish, even though there's plenty to go around. Of course, when we're greedy and selfish, 
it's usually because we don't believe that there's enough to go around. We don't trust that God creates enough for all of humanity. We think we have to fight for our part. We sometimes see this in the church. We're not unlike the Nazarenes who grew angry at Jesus when he said he was headed outwards to share the good news outside of the hometown. As church, we are quick to authorize large expenditures for physical plant needs or, frankly, for things for ourselves, but we're slower to do so for the needs of those outside of our immediate community. I think this is probably true for us as individuals. <sighs> Honest, I don't blink about impulse buying new running shoes. And yet, I spend lots of time in prayer and reflection on what amount is just the right amount that I should pledge to support the needs of the unhoused. Our economic system and our biology predispose us toward greed and selfishness. But it doesn't have to be that way. We were not created by God to be selfish. Survival requires our basic needs are met, that we remove the log from our eyes so that we can take the good news outward into the world, so that we can be a blessing to the world. The challenge, of course, is to find balance. When the church is at its best, we help one another keep our hearts and minds focused on following Jesus outward from Nazareth in order to liberate the oppressed in the world. Another way we do this is by meeting the emotional, physical, and financial needs of everyone inside the church community so that then they are able to go outward and be a blessing. Another way we do this is by challenging one another. We ask questions of one another about who benefits and who is left out each time that we make a decision. We keep one another honest and focused on the teachings of Jesus. That's what we do when we're at our best. Now, sometimes we are good at this, and sometimes we are not so good at this. Always we can be better. Always we can grow. Sadly, as we've seen in recent weeks and years, the balance between seeing that basic needs are met and moving outward gets muddled up among some of our neighbors. Greed and fear can overtake us or our neighbors who see people of differing colors or political views as enemies. On January 6th, white supremacy and fears of the other led to five deaths at the Capitol. And shocking plans and scenes are still coming forward. As we head into this week, there are credible reports about planned violence against state capitals, the inauguration, courthouses, and even a few about progressive churches. This can be unnerving and this can be frightening. Standing for love of neighbor and striving to be good news to the poor, to liberate the oppressed and proclaim economic justice can be a risky proposition in our fragmented world. Jesus and the prophet Isaiah, whom Jesus quotes, know this from first-hand experience. Just as some in Jesus' hometown grew angry and violent at the good news that is for all of humanity, that is, goes outward, some of our, our, our American neighbors are angry right now. God did not create a planet in which it is essential that we compete with one another for crumbs. God created a world with enough. Let me say that again. God created a world with enough. When we act as if everyone is not only worthy, a worthy child of God, but a necessary member of the human family, that we need them and that they need us, that is when we will glimpse the kingdom of God that God dreams for us. Theologian and activist, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., called us forward to the beloved community. He was met with resistance 
and angry white supremacist mobs. Yet he held steady to his calling from God. One of the things I know about human growth and development after 30 years working with children is that it is always accompanied by a sense of disequilibrium. The classic image that comes to my mind is of the, the infant moaning and groaning, expressing great frustration as she struggles to pull herself to a sit. I know that when my runs become too easy, I'm not gaining muscle and strength, and I need to seek out new challenges. We do not grow when we're comfortable. We grow in times like these. Queen Esther did not rise to lead and save the Jewish people when life was easy. She did so when the Jewish people were in enforced exile. When Esther was in angst, unsure about what her next step should be, her guardian and her cousin Mordecai encouraged her, saying, Who knows but that you have come to your royal position for just such a time as this. Though the folks at home rejected Jesus, his ministry changed the world for the better. Jesus' struggles, Jesus' teachings, and yes, even his death, were all a part of the story that led us forward. The same was true in Esther's time. In our time, though challenges and fragmentation are significant, we are called to be people of hope, people of justice, and people of expansive love. In the words of Anglican Bishop Desmond Tutu, we are living in an historic moment. We are each called to take part in a great transformation. Our survival as a species is threatened by global warming, economic meltdown, and an ever-increasing gap between rich and poor. Yet these threats offer an opportunity to awaken as an interconnected and beloved community. The beloved community. God's kingdom. It's on the horizon. Do you not perceive it? Amen. These times are getting the best of me. My mind, my soul, my tired body, my whole being is off. I keep looking for something familiar, something foundational, something solid that makes me feel secure. I think of you and search for a sermon verse or song, anything that used to soothe my troubles, feed my soul, enliven my spirit, keep me going. I want a message from a resistant prophet. I want an invitation to leave work and come see miracles. I want to know you love and protect me. I long to feel safe. Just come up strong around me. Hold me. You know, I used to think of you differently. I was so sure. So certain I had it all figured out. But then I experienced loss. And emptiness. And inhumanity and insanity and realized I had to grow up. I left all that I knew to know you, the you beyond the metaphors, the eternal, true God. You are more than I expected, 
Nothing and no one on earth is like you. There isn't anything that measures up to your love. It never loses and it never leaves. You are the living will. You are the enduring love. You are the speaking word. You are the stabilizing matter, the ground of all being. Reassure us in our time of need, God. Surround us and secure us in your love. There isn't anything that measures up to your love. It never loses and it never leaves. Welcome to the table. God has sent an invitation and everyone is welcome. We're here to remember the last meal Jesus had with his, with his disciples when he told them he would be with them and to remember his words and his works. That's comforting. God is with us, God is all around us, and God is in this world. We really do need comfort. But there's also something disquieting about this meal, uncomfortable. Now we see ourselves and everyone else and the world around us through God's eyes. We see the pain, the suffering, the betrayal, and we're asked to do something about it. We see, as Jesus saw, what is really needed to make one whole, what is really needed to make systems work. That's our challenge. What do we do? How do we do it? The bread is broken. The juice is poured. Come, share the meal. Pray with me. God, how much we need your comfort now in a world beyond our imagination. Help us to find balance and peace. Encourage us to bring peace and justice in everything that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. the beloved community, God's kingdom. It's on the horizon. Do you not perceive it? Mm -hmm.